Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. We're so glad to have with us for this series my friend and colleague Jim Kenny, who will be talking with us informally about cultural evolution in our time. The ideas we'll be discussing are developed in depth in Jim's book, which is available on Kindle. It's called Thriving in the Cross Current, Clarity and Hope in a Time of Cultural Sea Change. I'll tell you a little bit about Jim. He is founder and executive director of the Interreligious Engagement Project. He is co-founder and executive director of Common Ground, an adult educational organization and study center. He is the founding trustee of the International Committee for the Peace Council and it currently its project coordinator and co-editor of Interreligious Insight, a journal of dialogue and engagement. Jim is fo former founding trustee and global director of a council for a parliament of the world's religions. So today we'll be witnessing dramatically accelerated cultural evolution on a scale seldom seen. And most people don't realize it's going on. It's easy to miss if you keep track of global dynamics by means of the news media. There the news tends to be mostly bad from the latest senseless act of violence to the violence of war, from the callousness of local unfairness to the poor, the hungry, the jobless, the homeless. But research demonstrates that human culture has steadily evolved toward greater non-zero sumness, which means social cooperation and interdependence. In other words, Jim will tell you that our dominant values are moving toward a closer fit with reality. So Jim, in your book, you argue very strongly for ongoing cultural evolution. So tell us a little more about what you mean by that. Do cultures somehow evolve and, and what, 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 what might that mean? Well, that's the basic question. Uh, do cultures evolve or do they merely change? Uh, and uh, I have to tell you a little bit of background. Uh, this grows out of a question that I've been asking everywhere at forums and uh, lectures and conferences and seminars in my classes uh, and uh, here in the United States and around the world. And the question, I've been asking it for 30 years, uh, do you believe we live in an age of cultural growth or, uh, I'm sorry, of moral growth or moral decay? I don't have to tell you that virtually every audience that I've ever confronted with that question has given the decay answer. We live in an age of moral decay especially as we're recording this uh, first session, uh, the horrible uh, act of, of violence in Las Vegas has just taken place. And I guarantee you that if you meet people on the street and ask them, do, you, do we live in an age of moral growth or moral decay, they're all gonna uh, jump headfirst into the decay argument. The only reason I'm asking this question is because uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm looking for an opening to say, Au contraire, you know, it's not like that. Uh, uh, there's every reason to believe uh, that we're living in an age of moral growth. So I wanted to explore this and explore it uh, more directly and in much greater depth. The result of that uh, was several years of research and, and lectures and uh, again, seminars like this. Uh, and finally, uh, the book, Thriving in the Cross Current. Uh, very simply put, what I mean by cultural, well, let me back up and say my first premise, the first thing I want to say and get across is that cultural evolution is real. This is a very controversial idea. Uh, lots and lots of, of scholars and students of human culture and so on do not believe that, that cultures evolve. Uh, they believe instead that they merely change. But I believe that culture, uh, human culture is always evolving even though usually very, very slowly and incrementally. By cultural evolution, I mean the steady movement of our dominant values. And I wanna stress, and we're gonna talk about this over and over again throughout this webinar. I wanna stress that this is about values, not just about behaviors. Uh, the way to measure cultural evolution is not by looking at our institutions, not by looking at at the latest act of violence or the latest act of goodness, but uh, by looking as closely as we can with tools that I will be describing at our human values. So by cultural evolution, simply put, I mean that our human values move slowly but inexorably in the direction of a closer fit with our gradually changing 
deeper and deeper perception and understanding of reality. So values move toward a closer fit with reality. One quick example, uh, took a long time, uh, took all of human history and most of human history uh, for uh, human cultures to begin to uh, understand and acknowledge that slavery is always and everywhere wrong. Throughout most of human prehistory and history, it was taken as a given. It was taken, it was, it was blessed in the scripture of almost every religious tradition, and it was practiced just about everywhere. Uh, but now, even though there are still little pockets around the world where, where slavery is practiced, even though, uh, even in this country, we still have adherents who think we ought to go back to a system of enslavement of people of color, Nevertheless, the legitimacy has long since gone out of that idea. And today, uh, the notion that slavery is always and everywhere wrong is clearly here to stay. Uh, another very big example is patriarchy. Well, no one would argue that patriarchy is gone. All we have to do is look at some of those politicians on the other side of the aisle that would cheerfully bring it back. Uh, but the legitimacy has gone out of the idea that that men are always and everywhere superior to women. Uh, and we, we simply know that that's not true. Uh, and it's, uh, we're, living in, we're living proof uh, of, of that change. Actually, uh, those of us uh, who, are, uh, who came of age since the 60s lived through the most profound uh, value shift, I think, uh, in, in recent human history or in, in much of human history, and that is the change in the way we value and accord status to and understand and enter into relationship, all of us, men and women alike, with women. Not all the work is done by any means. Long, long way to go, uh, but long way we have come. Uh, so that's essentially what I mean by, by cultural evolution. I could easily and, and will, before we finish with this webinar, go through a long list of, of things that have changed in our society and culture that, that help me get up in the morning and put a spring in my step. Uh, uh, there are a couple of uh, things that I, I just want to read to you uh, from uh, a couple of times from the book and a couple of times, if you don't mind, from uh, a couple of articles. But uh, here in a, a fairly recent article I've written, inevitably we return to the question with which we began, with which we just began, um, are we living, uh, in other words, in a time of moral and cultural growth or moral and cultural decay, of cultural evolution and civilizational erosion, or of, of, prom uh, uh, of promise and hope, or hopelessness and surrender? We wonder if we have attended at all to the awful news uh, that surrounds us, uh, whether we have arrived at civilization's edge, how indeed does one find the ground of hope today? Isn't it true that ours is in so many ways the worst of times? Uh, isn't it obvious that the human condition is irremediable? Isn't it time to repair to the fortresses, to circle the wagons? Shouldn't we now finally throw up our hands in despair and surrender to the inevitable. Isn't it time to give up? It's not so obvious, um, but the answer is no. It's neither the time to despair nor the time to quit. It's the time to clarify our understanding of complex human-human and human-earth dynamics and to get to work. It's time now to acknowledge the outrages that surround us and still to recognize and even to cherish the sense of moral outrage that such horrors have produced in all of us or in most of us. Uh, if the chaos of our age had given rise only to a general lassitude, uh, then we might despair. Um, but that's not been the case, right? Uh, I think in the, the very, if you ask people, are we living in an age of moral decay? And they say, yes, you hear, the heartbreak and the outrage in their voices. And that heartbreak and outrage is a sign that their values, at least, are alive and well and, and moving in a progressive direction. They're hoping for better, they're expecting better, and so on. Uh, if people just went, nah, it's, it's just as we always expected, things are getting worse and worse, and who cares? That would be a sign of decay.
So there. <laughs> Not hearing me. You also say that that cultural evolution is somehow punctuated, that there are periods when it, it's accelerated and periods when it's less accelerated. I, I notice that many of us are feeling an acceleration of circumstances all around us in our lives now, sometimes tending to a, um, a sensation of chaos in a sense. So talk, talk to us a little bit about this accelerated or punctuated notion of sea change. Well, uh Sea change is the punctuation, and I'll tell you a little bit in a moment of where I got that term and, and why it, it speaks to me so magically, and it does. Uh, but I believe, as I said before, that cultural evolution moves slowly but inexorably in the direction of that closer fit with reality. But every now and then, and it's rare, I, uh, I don't believe it's happened very often in human prehistory and history, but every now and then there comes a period uh, uh, in time uh, where uh, the shift in values toward a closer fit with reality is somehow dramatically accelerated. And uh, I'm gonna say later on in the webinar, accelerated across the board, as our, we enter a period where not only our, our ideas about peace and, and nonviolent conflict resolution changing, but our ideas about social and economic justice and human rights are changing apace with them. And hand in hand, our ideas about ecological sustainability. By the way, those three go together and I'll be mentioning them often. Activists around the world often use the abbreviation PJS for peace, justice and sustainability and they as you well know move together hand in hand and every now and then we find ourselves in a period where yeah uh, uh, our ideas about peace and nonviolence, our ideas about social and economic justice and human rights and our ideas about the sacredness and the fragility of the earth all seem to be moving ahead in a progressive direction and moving ahead dramatically those periods I refer to as sea changes. Um, and let me just tell you that sea change comes from William Shakespeare. It comes from The Tempest. Uh, and uh, in The Tempest, there's a, a, a character, uh, uh, I think his name is Fernando, I forget. Uh, but he believes incorrectly that his father is dead. And the sprite Ariel, who's uh, sort of the trickster character in The Tempest, uh, comes to him and he sings this. He sings or sit, recites, full fathom five, thy father lies. Very famous Shakespearean line. Full fathom five, thy father lies. Of his bones are coral made. Those pearls that were his eyes. Uh, nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. As far as we know, that's the first time anybody ever used the term sea change. He hyphenated it, eventually the hyphen would drop out. For the next century or two, uh, it was used more and more often in literature and it always meant a change wrought by the sea. But gradually it dropped that uh, and it came to mean a sweeping change that leaves nothing untouched. So a sea change is not just the advent of the computer age, uh, but it is uh, a change that, that touches everything, business and religion, and spirituality and personal relations and, and uh, everything that you can possibly imagine, literature, song and story. Uh, and I believe and, uh, that we've lived through, that we're in one of those periods now, a lot of evidence to the contrary, people would say, but I think if you look around and you know what you're looking for, and that's what this webinar is all about, what to look for, how to look for it, how to recognize it, how to test it, we'll do all of those things. Uh, but if you know what to look for, you'll come away saying, yeah, we really are in a period of this kind of change. Let me just tell you quickly that I think it's happened at least four times. It might be 20 times, but I doubt that. Uh, there are four that I feel confident about. And the first I, I call the rise of the farmers. It's about 10,000 years ago. Uh, technically it's the shift from the Paleolithic, the old stone age to the new stone age. Uh, but 
uh, although when we originally made the designation of Paleolithic and Neolithic, we were talking about certain changes in stone tool making. But today, when we use that term, when we talk about the Neolithic, the rise of the Neolithic, we mean the movement of human populations toward settled agrarian life. That's why tools change. Uh, but the big thing that changed was that the ice went away. Uh, uh, imagine uh, 14,000 years ago, uh, up somewhere not too far north, and walking along the edge of an ice wall that towered above you as much as two miles. Imagine that. And in the course of 4,000 years, that ice melted, receded, and all of a sudden, uh, the world changed and uh, agriculture was possible, warmth returned and, and so on. How much do you imagine changed in the shift from hunter-gatherer culture to settled agrarian culture? How did the relationship between men and women change? It changed profoundly. Um, uh, who, who invented architecture? I, I'm convinced, uh, and maybe this is a romantic fancy, but I think the evidence is good. I'm convinced that it was a woman that we might today call a scientist who was paying attention and noticed that, that uh, where there were seeds, there were plants. And, and so anyway, huge change uh, that changed everything that it touched. The next happened uh, something like uh, from about 1000 BCE to the year zero. There was no year zero, but had there been. Uh, and that thousand year period, the first millennium BCE, uh, is referred to as the Axial Age. It's the period in which all of the great classical religions that we recognize today were born. Before that had been the religion of state and temple, and the pharaoh was the chief priest and so on. Now all of a sudden we shift from this, the state religion to the religion of the individual. And we begin to recognize the dimension of the transcendent. We begin to talk about ethics uh, and, and, and so on. And the next one I talk about uh, is, uh, I call it the Copernican planet quake, uh, but it's the scientific revolution. Uh, and I don't have to tell you all that the scientific revolution uh, touched and changed everything. It's the beginning of modernity, beginning of modernity. We don't have a name to put to whatever is going on now, but it's going on uh, and the change that's happening now in terms of P, J and S, peace, justice and sustainability, I think is, it's revolutionary, it's extraordinary. Um, so I call it, I call these, these occasional punctuations, sea changes. And obviously the one I'm most interested in is the one we're living in now. I don't spend a lot of time uh, wandering around the scientific revolution, uh, except to find illustrations for that help us in the time we're living in now. One of the reasons that we're spending the next several weeks with you in a webinar type tutorial where you can share with us these notions of cultural evolution and sea change is because in weeks after that you'll continue to join us along with other guests and we'll be discussing incidents that are happening in our news in a contemporary way. And one of the reasons for getting this great background is so that we can start to have a bit of a different perspective in the way that we're interpreting those real-time events, so-called, in the context of this, the background of this new philosophical structure that's relevant to our social environment. And so I know that we'll get more deeply into this in later conversations, but do you think you can give us some insight into the highlights of life in an evolving culture um, in the context of, of the really, you know, sometimes devastating news that we're getting from day to day? How do we stay hopeful by keeping the perspective of cultural evolution and sea change in the front of our minds? Here's uh, two things I'd like to introduce, and I think I can do it pretty quickly. And one, I'll just, uh, uh, I'll read a short passage from the book, but uh, uh, we're going to be talking next time in the next section about two waves, one on its way out and one on its way in 
So let me just read you a little passage here. Imagine an ocean moment, two waves converging in the same time and space. One is powerful, but subsiding. The other just gathering momentum and presence, but not yet cresting. At the moment of their meeting, they are nearly equal in amplitude and influence. As they cross, who can say which is rising, which descending? In that moment, only the chaos of wave interference exists. Now imagine modernity as a powerful wave of cultural values that crested half a century ago and is slowly beginning to subside. At the same time, a second wave of countervailing values rises equally slowly, building until its crest begins to rival the declining energy of the older wave. The older wave has long been dominant. It's long been dominant, but now, I gotta get my hand in where you can see it, but now it starts to subside. And here comes the newer wave, come on up, <laughs> newer wave rising. What happens at the point in time when the older set of values like patriarchy, like the notion that earth is unfragile, like the notion that peace and justice are, are fool's dreams that can never be attained, when those older values that have outlived their usefulness and have been challenged by anomalies, when they're declining, newer values that say peace matters, uh, the earth is fragile, uh, justice is attainable and, and vital, uh, when they are uh, equal in influence, the one on its way out, the one on its way in, but roughly equal in influence, what's it like to live in that moment? Well, we'll be saying, it's exactly like this. That's where we live. The older value on the way out has influence equal to the influence of the newer value on the way in, but the older value has inertia. The newer value, or the newer wave, I'm sorry, has momentum. Give me momentum over inertia every time. Uh, and so living in that time of the crossing, there are going to be people who say yay, as in Y-E-A, they are yay sayers, yay to the new way. And there are going to be people who say nay to the naysayers to the new way. And uh, we're going to see a pattern of turbulence and chaos that I, since I'm using all these watery wave metaphors and so on, that I describe as, as eddies. And an eddy is a counterclockwise whirlpool in a, that, that, to anthropomorphize it, that tries desperately to reverse the prevailing flow of a stream. Now, no eddy was ever able to reverse the flow of a stream, but that doesn't keep them from trying. Uh, and if your boat gets caught in one or you get caught in one, uh, you can be in serious trouble. So uh, uh, I look at acts of tremendous violence or the fact that we have uh, uh, people in power in our culture, people with great power in our culture that seem to be utterly clueless and profoundly mean-spirited. Uh, should we gauge whether we're living in a time of cultural evolution by those things, or should we recognize that those things, the unconscionable violence, the, the rise of the angry morons of the world, uh, should we look at those as signs of the future or as uh, evidence of backlash against an inevitable future? It's backlash, and that's what I mean by an eddy. Uh, and just, we'll talk much more about that. And having that idea of the eddy, that I can look at something and say, wait a minute, is that really the wave of the future? Or is that the angry backlash of a past that feels itself losing its grip. Yeah, this stuff is fascinating. And I know that we want to get into a lot more. So tell us um, just briefly, what are, what's in store for us next time? What are we going to talk about next time we meet here with you? Well, I roughly talked about two waves. And I'd like to say a little bit more about that. I'd also like to say uh, that there are a few benchmarks that we can turn to. As we, as we look at some new development and say, look, is this part of the sea change? 
uh, or is it just a happenstance? Is it how how can I recognize a change that's really part of the cultural uh, cultural evolutionary shift? There have to be some benchmarks, uh, some tests uh, that I can apply, and uh, I've I've identified three very simple benchmarks. So we'll talk about the two waves. We'll look at a graphic of of the two waves. Uh, and uh, we'll also talk about three benchmarks. I think we can do that uh, pretty quickly, pretty simply, and it really gives you some tools to begin to work with as you try to make sense of a world that seems sometimes nonsensical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thanks. This is a great start, and um, I'm sure everyone's appreciating the discussion. It gives us a lot to think about. So. We'll see you next time, and I hope everyone comes back to join us then, too. Bye. Thanks. Bye.